Pakistan nearly considered a retaliatory response to the accidental missile that was fired from the Indian side. That is what Bloomberg is reporting. I'm Barkhadat, you're with the Mojo Story. Today we try and decode what was behind this accidental firing of a missile that has been ascribed to a technical malfunction? Defense Minister Rajnath Singh has revealed some details on the floor of parliament, saying that India's missile system is both secure and safe, but standard operating procedures are being reviewed. What we know is that this cruise missile was spotted by Pakistan, which soon realized that something was amiss. We do not have many more details yet, but it is somewhat heartening to see that both countries, both nuclear powers, have been able to address this without any major crisis and without any loss to life at all. But there are obviously lessons to be learned from this and questions to be asked and answered, keeping all of our national security considerations obviously in mind. Let's bring you the best possible experts to do precisely that for us. We're joined on the program by veteran military officer, General Raj Kadian. Welcome to the program, sir. We're also joined by veteran diplomat, Ambassador TCA Raghavan, who has served as High Commissioner of India to Pakistan. We're joined uh, by strategic affairs expert, Ms. Rajeshwari Pillay Rajagopalan, who works with uh, the Observer Research Foundation. Thank you, Ms. Pillay, for joining us. And from Pakistan today, we are joined by Mushar of Zaidi, who's a journalist and columnist. Welcome, everybody. And it is a sensitive subject. The countries have kept it civil, despite uh, a little bit of rhetoric uh, and a little bit of a sort of disagreement, which is to be expected for something as sensitive as alarming as this. But I think it's important to recognize that the countries have kept it uh, extremely sensitive and civil, and we hope to do the same on this program. Let me start with you, uh, uh, Ambassador Raghavan, if I may. Bloomberg is today talking about a near retaliatory response by Pakistan, which Pakistan stepped back from as soon as it realized, quote unquote, that something was amiss. What do you make of everything we know so far? We'll play out the defense minister's response in just a moment, but your response is first. Well, I would agree with you that uh, this uh, issue has been handled uh, well. Uh, it was uh, good that the uh, Pakistan authorities uh, kept their response to strong statements. Uh, it was, I think, an excellent move by the government of India to say that there was a uh, misfunction and thereafter make a statement on parliament with such details as could be shared and that a committee of inquiry has been uh, ordered. Uh, so I think on the whole, uh, this has been handled as well as can be expected. There is, of course, a larger issue that uh, relations between India and Pakistan are deeply adversarial. Uh, and in that context, anything which happens can uh, escalate. Uh, uh, it doesn't necessarily only apply uh, to missiles. There's a whole range of other issues which can uh, escalate. But it's good to see that uh, at uh, over such a sensitive issue, the matter has been well handled. I would say there's an element of continuity when one sees the ceasefire agreement which was reached uh, uh, last year. And uh, that, that agreement also has uh, been reasonably uh, robust. So to that extent, in a bad bilateral situation, that tensions have slowly uh, or slightly being eased downwards is, I think, a positive development. Uh, I, I completely agree with you. And I wonder if it might, in fact, open a window for this uh, complete uh, sort of cold freeze, uh, you know, to be thawed just a little bit. But before we before we actually uh, get to that, may I ask you, Ambassador Raghavan, uh, you know, there are obviously in such situations a certain amount of conflicting narratives that will emerge. Uh, Indian Air Force sources, for example, are saying that Pakistan was informed immediately after this accident took place. Pakistan is denying this. Bloomberg today talking about a near retaliatory response that was averted. What did you make of this Bloomberg report? Well, uh, I think when something like this happens, there will be a spate of news reports, uh, speculative or otherwise, uh, inevitably. So I'm not entirely surprised by the a report, but as I said, I think on the whole, both sides handled the situation as well as could be uh, expected. 
the larger issues, as I said, are also important. The fact that there is a ceasefire agreement uh, in place. Uh, but uh, as I said, the relationship is a deeply adversarial one. There is a, a la there is an absence of an overall political uh, framework within which such issues can be uh, addressed. And certainly those are lacuna which will have to be addressed in the uh, in the future. Uh, your reference to the deep freeze is also a valid one. Uh, the history of India-Pakistan relations suggests that no freeze, deep or otherwise, is ever permanent. There is a cyclical regularity to uh, the overall rhythm and the overall uh, state of India-Pakistan relations. So we have to see when that rhythm comes into play uh, and uh, uh, becomes more evident than it is now. Yeah. Uh, and actually, we do now have some reports that there, were, uh, there was a seven minute window. This must have been nerve wracking both for the Indians and the Pakistani establishment. I can't even imagine uh, how high tensions were. The Indian Air Force, we know, shut down uh, the Air Force uh, uh, space so that no further uh, sort of, uh, uh, you know, missiles could be fired. But was that enough? We the, These are questions that are, of course, going to be asked uh, for a few weeks to come. Uh, India has announced a probe. Pakistan is pushing for a joint probe. I very much doubt that that is going to happen. But first, let's listen into what the defense minister said on the floor of parliament, and then we'll open this up for the panel. <laughs> मिसाइल यूनिट के रूटीन मेंटेनेंस और इंस्ट्रक्शन के दौरान शाम को लगभग 7 बजे दुर्घटनावश एक मिसाइल रिलीज हो गई बाद में ज्ञात हुआ कि यह मिसाइल पाकिस्तान के क्षेत्र में जाकर गिरी यह घटना खेदजनक है परंतु यह राहत की बात है कि इस दुर्घटना से किसी भी प्रकार का कोई नुकसान नहीं हुआ है सभापति महोदय मैं सदन को सूचित करना चाहता हूं कि सरकार ने इस घटना को बहुत ही गंभीरता पूर्वक लिया है और इसके लिए एक औपचारिक उच्च स्तरीय जांच के आदेश भी दे दिए गए हैं कथित दुर्घटना का सटीक कारण जांच के बाद ही पता चल पाएगा मैं यह भी कहना चाहूंगा कि इस घटना के संदर्भ में ऑपरेशंस मेंटेनेंस तथा इंस्ट्रक्शन के लिए स्टैंडर्ड ऑपरेटिंग प्रोसीजर्स की समीक्षा भी की जा रही है हम अपने वेपन सिस्टम की सेफ्टी और सिक्योरिटी को सर्वोच्च प्राथमिकता देते हैं इस संबंध में यदि किसी भी प्रकार की खामी पाई जाती है तो उसे तुरंत दूर किया जाएगा मैं सदन को आश्वस्त करना चाहता हूं कि हमारा मिसाइल सिस्टम अत्यंत सुरक्षित और भरोसेमंद है इसके अलावा हमारे सेफ्टी प्रोसीजर्स और प्रोटोकॉल्स उच्च स्तरीय हैं और समय समय पर इसकी समीक्षा भी की जाती है हमारी आर्म फोर्सेज वेल ट्रेंड एवं डिसिप्लिन है और इस प्रकार के सिस्टम को हैंडल करने का अच्छा अनुभव भी रखती है so what we've seen uh, rajeshri if i can get you then and then i'll go to general kadian and musharraf zaidi is uh, that at the deepest of uh, sort of crisis moments uh, both countries have uh, have shown a kind of sobriety that in fact is you know sometimes falls short in 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 triggers that are less grave but what alarms you the most of what we have seen and what we know so far ms pille no, I think there is a lot of uh, uh, the, uh, the two leader uh, leadership and both countries have shown certain amount of restraint. I think I think uh, that is to be uh, that is to be appreciated uh, because even if the uh, there there are multiple uh, versions or multiple explanation as to why Pakistan did not respond. Maybe Pakistan did not detect the missile before it landed on its territory. Uh, the assumption is that they did not respond after they detected. But I think there are other critical questions that come into play uh, about the, for instance, self-destruct mechanism. What's that activated? Uh, so th there are a whole range of legitimate questions that could be uh, that could be looked into. Or was it uh, one whether it had a self-destruct mechanism? Second, whether it was activated. Um, and uh, a third question, whether it was activated and failed. 
uh, or if there was a problem with regard to the personnel handling this missile, uh, did they have an issue in terms of operating this uh, self-destruct mechanism? So there are a range of disturbing questions that might come about, but I don't think we have the, all the answers at this stage uh, until, until you come out and there is a sort of a, 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 a higher level inquiry comes out with a, its findings. Uh, we are all speculating in a sense as to what could have gone wrong, uh, that the technical glitch which alone says that doesn't really mean very much. But one thing that uh, the minister's statement uh, said that did not contain in the earlier MOD statement is that uh, the SOP, the standard operating procedures are also being reviewed and revised. That is something that says that they, it could have been something to do with the uh, a human error and not a technical glitch entirely. So that does give you some sense of what could have gone wrong. But again, it's too early. There isn't a whole lot of information available in the open uh, for us to conclude with any certainty as to what could have happened in a sense. Absolutely. And I think we might actually, uh, uh, you know, uh, we don't actually know what questions to to, to, to even ask uh, in a way beyond the theoretical ones that could have led to uh, such a situation, but a nightmare scenario uh, for both countries, uh, Musharraf, and a nightmare that has been averted. That has to uh, actually be conceded. I think we're all in agreement about that. Uh, uh, you know, obviously, there are not going to be identical narratives that emerge from India and Pakistan. That's expecting too much, especially given the cold freeze that uh, Ambassador Raghavan referenced. Uh, but Musharraf, uh, you know, your thoughts at this point. Thank you, Barka. I mean, I think the most important thing is uh, there's a shared sense of relief that uh, it landed in the way that it did. And uh, Alhamdulillah, you know, the Pakistani side uh, has continuously, I think, now going from February 2019 till now, I think adopted uh, in, uh, almost on every instance a de escalatory uh, sense of. Uh, responsiveness and, and reactiveness when it comes to uh, India and, and what India may do. Uh, I think the mention of February 2019 is important, not really to stir up, uh, you know, that that incident or debate, but, you know, obviously in South Asia, we're living in a state of continuum rather than um, having to judge any individual event on its singular merit. We have to look at what the uh, continuum of events looks like. And I think that given what happened in February 2019 uh, with the Balakot strike and uh, obviously the change in certainly, I mean, the, the kindest way and the, maybe the lightest way to put it would be the change of mood. But I think a fundamental change in the dynamic between the two countries is August 5th, 2019. Um, when you look at it in that context, we are already on a higher uh, sort of step in the escalatory ladder than we were uh, in, let's say, January 2019. And so, like I said, my, my first and, and primary instinct is, is a sense of relief that, that uh, people didn't die and that this didn't become a tit-for-tat situation. Um, yeah. Yeah. The, other, the other big, uh, yeah, sorry, Berka, sorry. Just, to, just I know I'm taking quite a while, but, but again, I think it's important for us, and I think your whole panel has demonstrated that, I think it's important for us when we have these discussions now, especially, uh, after all that's happened in the last two or three years is to choose our words carefully, which is why I'm taking so long with my, with my second point. But I guess I would say this, whether what happened was genuinely an accident, and I think it's legitimate for people to at least ask that question, or whether it was uh, for real. I think the kind of serious questions and, and really introspective discussion that needs to take place, I think in both countries, so, so I will say that on the Pakistan side, in terms of our air defense systems and in terms of, you know, what adequate re retaliatory escalation looks like, especially after Balakot, uh, you know, that, that question is live. But I think after this, it's going to become even more live. And so the peaceniks in both countries, but especially the ones in Pakistan, are now not only going to have to answer for generic peacenicky sort of attitudes, but also mm -hmm. for the idea that, you know, at some level, India, deliberately or not, deliberately in Balakot, supposedly accidentally in this case, has stepped up at least once or twice the, the escalatory ladder. And on every occasion, Pakistan essentially turns, uh, Pakistan is very Gandhian about this. And so I think me, that is going to become an issue of debate here in Pakistan in the months and years to come. 
I mean, I didn't interrupt you because needless to say, uh, as an Indian, uh, or, you know, and I, I speak, I think, for all, all of the Indians on this panel, we'd have a completely different perspective to your second point, Musharraf, uh, and that what you call Gandhian, we would call a sort of support of terror groups in the Kashmir Valley, What how we see Kashmir is fundamentally different, how we see the use of groups like the Lashkar Taiba is completely different. And I, for the life of me, can't imagine why any Pakistani, and I'd be curious to find out more from you in the course of this uh, program, would think that this was anything but uh, but an accident. Balakot uh, uh, followed a, pul a terror attack in Pulwama. This is completely decontextualizing, uh, you know, the history of Balakot. And why would this why would anybody think this is anything but accidental? But I'll come back to you. I'm sure you'll you'll be able to elaborate on that. Let me get General Kadian to come in at this point. Those differences between the Indian and Pakistani perspective well established. We know them. We all know them. Let's return to what the issue is at hand right now, General Kadian. And I think, you know, Ms. Pillay is right. There's a lot we don't know. And there's a lot, given the national security sensitivities, that we are possibly never going to know. As a military officer, sir, what would be your concern to you right now? Barka, firstly, I agree with Ambassador Raghavan and others that post the accidental firing, the event has been handled by both countries in a very mature and responsible manner. But that doesn't solve the problem. Till the inquiry report is made public, which the government needs to hurry up and make public as soon as possible, Till that speculation will remain rife, it is already rife on the social media and other fora. If it is proved that it was a technical mishap, the missile got fired due to technical problem, then it doesn't do any credit to India or on our competence. A nuclear power which can reach Mars much faster than the other countries, to make such a mistake, that too, against a country with whom our relations are frictional, which is a nuclear power. Of course, landing in another country would have been as serious, but it adds a different dimension when we relate it to Pakistan. So till the reasons are out, it could be human failure. In that case, also, we don't come out as a responsible country in handling our uh, sensitive strategic assets. So till the inquiry is out, I don't know. We don't even know whether it was what missile it was. Some say it was a Brahmos missile, which is highly unlikely. Some say it was just a fast flying object. And so one doesn't know why, why the fast flying object, if that is the case, uh, was actually thrown into the sky. As per Pakistani reports, it, uh, it went up 12 kilometers high and it flew into their territory for 204 seconds, nearly three and a half minutes which is long enough time for Pakistan uh, to take countermeasures, particularly after Balakot, I am sure their air defense systems are very alert. Speculation also says that Pakistan have sacked the general who is responsible for air defense, which uh, throws a different light. Of course, it is speculation whether it is true or not. Mr. Jaidi may be able to clarify. But that means that they actually wanted to counteract, but they did not react. So I don't know, the speculation will arrive. The government needs to come clean and make a, a permit public the detailed reason why it happened. In either case, it is a bad thing for reputation of, of India, whether competence-wise or responsibility-wise, what has happened is serious. Well, I think you heard, we heard the defense minister saying it is deeply regrettable. The fact that SOPs are being reviewed points to, I think, as Ms. Pillay said, this being more than a technical malfunction. Uh, it means that a certain amount of handling has been found uh, to be lacking. Uh, but, I, you know, I want to say about both of, both of our nations, though I'm nobody except somebody who's reported on, 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 on India-Pakistan relations for two decades, that whatever be our other flaws, I don't think either country has a death wish. Uh, so to think that, you know, somebody... Uh, in India would do this uh, from anything but incompetence. And to think that somebody in Pakistan might have been sacked because a retaliatory uh, response didn't take place, we have to be relieved, uh, actually, that that, that that didn't happen, that Pakistan was able to spot uh, what clearly was something that was not designed to hurt uh, uh, Pakistani targets or the people of Pakistan. Obviously, something in the pa uh, someone in the Pakistani establishment high up was able to recognize that uh, pretty quickly. Before I uh, go back to Ambassador Raghavan, Ms. Pili, if you want to jump in on the points that have been made both by General Kadian and Musharraf Zaid. 
can be Sorry, made available. Yeah. Yeah, just Hello. start over. We we missed your first couple of words. Just start yeah. over. Go ahead, ma'am. Yeah. yeah. So uh, I think one of the points uh, I think that uh, we are going to grapple with is what kind of information is going to be available. I think it would be really nice to have a lot of information about what went wrong in the public, um, so that uh, I think the overall public confidence also that India is a responsible stakeholder, responsible nuclear power. It can handle these weapons uh, in a mature fashion. There are there, there are no. Uh, issues when it com comes to uh, competency, efficiency, uh, and also with regard to our training and so on and so forth. So I think it'll be a really good to have a lot of information. But I'm not sure, even after the inquiry is done, that there's a whole lot of information that's going to be available in the open. And first of all, the inquiry is going to look at, for instance, what happened uh, with the actual firing, how it got fired, why, uh, for instance, the self-destruct mechanism was not activated or was it activated and it failed uh, and not so much into what kind of missile where was there and so on and so forth. So I think that is going to be number one. Second, uh, I think what kind of information should be available um, given the sensitivity of this uh, uh, of the subject? I think that's going to be an important aspect. For instance, uh, I think there are questions about the flight path uh, did it veer away from the flight path or was it was there a problem in terms of the um, uh, uh, finding the right target what was it uh, but i don't think the releasing that such kind of information uh, in the open is also a healthy thing to do because i think that really exposes uh, to your adversaries as to the kind of uh, flight paths that uh, our missiles would yeah. take and i don't think that's a uh, healthy thing to uh, put out such kind of information in the open second it also exposes the fact that we know about possible uh, the air defense gaps or the radar uh, coverage gaps uh, on the Pakistani side. And I, we don't want that information to be available in the open so that Pakistan can strengthen those air defenses around the border areas and kind of things. So I think the information bit that's going to be out in the open, even after the inquiry is done, I think that's going to be, uh, we cannot expect a whole lot of things. But I think what needs to happen is that we need to have a thorough inquiry that's, uh, that comes out with clearer understanding of what went wrong. Uh, serious actions need to be taken and actions need to be taken. And I think the minister cannot just make a statement in the parliament that these actions have been taken. I think this has to be, there has to be uh, additional certain steps taken to reassure one, our yeah. own people, but at the same time, our global nuclear community as well. Because I think at the end of the day, how do you communicate to the rest of the world also? that sure. you are a responsible stakeholder because this was something uh, but again i i don't want to overplay this because nuclear, yeah i just want to nuclear, ac yeah. nuclear accidents I, have I, happened I mean, in was, other countries I was just going to say north korea, south korea just put out a statement about a north, north korean uh, missile so yes this this is not unique uh, or this is not a first ever moment uh, in the history of communities that are nuclear nations but uh, i think that the important point to understand and acknowledge is that we're not going to get answers to a lot of these questions we're raising uh, uh, let's let's accept that that there's going to have to be some leap of faith that both countries are going to have to uh, make uh, in this moment before i come back to ambassador raghavan uh, of course at this point pakistan is pushing for a joint probe but I think we're all hard-nosed enough here to know that that will not happen. Let's listen in to what Pakistan's Prime Minister Imran Khan had to say. And inshallah, these who are in front of us, we get to 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 ہمارا ملک وہ ہے جو اپنی دفاع کر سکتا ہے جو اس وقت صحیح راستے پہ چلا گیا ہے جس کی معاشرت صحیح جا رہی ہے اور جو انشاءاللہ اگلے ڈیڑھ سال ہوں گے اس میں آپ دیکھیں گے کہ یہ ملک ادھر پہنچ جائے گا جو اگر ہم انیس سو سنتالیس میں صحیح معنی پہ چل پڑتے تو آج ہم کہاں کے کہاں پہنچ چکے ہوتے now, Ambassador Raghavan, since Musharraf Zaidi did bring up from a Pakistani perspective the context of the abrogation of Article 370, Pulwama, Balakot, I think Indians looking at that Imran Khan speech would also bring up the context of domestic politics, looking at a Pakistani prime minister that isn't right now seen to be on his strongest wicket. Uh, the handling of this accidental missile, what might that, uh, you know, how do we associate or locate it within uh, the larger context of the India-Pakistan equation, but also the domestic politics that are unfolding within Pakistan at this hour? Well, there is always domestic politics unfolding in Pakistan. 
uh, and uh, that does provide perhaps uh, to some extent uh, an explanation for the rhetoric which comes out. But the situation is uh, serious enough, even if we exclude uh, the domestic uh, factors. Uh, I think uh, uh, the militaries on both sides uh, possibly have a better understanding of each other's capabilities and capacities than is normally conceded in the public uh, domain. Uh, and I think this better understanding uh, is precisely the factor which led to this uh, more uh, sober and restrained uh, reaction to this uh, somewhat uh, unusual kind of uh, situation. Uh, but the fact is, uh, and this is my view, that uh, a good understanding between the militaries, as was demonstrated uh, by the coming into effect or the reinforcing of the ceasefire, can only take you so far. You do need an enabling political uh, environment. And there I would slightly disagree with uh, what Musharraf uh, just said. I think uh, there is a longer history to the deterioration in relations. Uh, and it goes back five or six years. And certainly uh, the legislative changes uh, in JNK contributed to that uh, further from the Pakistani uh, perspective. But there is a longer history which we have to take into account. It's useful to recall that many of the confidence building measures which were put in place in the first decade uh, of this century really followed up on uh, uh, the improvement uh, in the political environment following the uh, Lahore uh, MOU. You know, that was a result, uh, the result of a major political initiative by both sides when Prime Minister Vajpayee uh, visited uh, Pakistan uh, in 1998 and that led to uh, nuclear... Yeah. Uh, a series of nuclear CBM. So I think the overall political environment uh, is really the key uh, factor. It is good that there is a uh, understanding between the, the militaries which led to the ceasefire or which has enabled the ceasefire to be a robust one. But I don't think we should rely excessively only on the security uh, understandings yeah. which exist. I, we do need to reinforce yeah. that. Let me just jump in and uh, I'll take this to Musharraf in a second. But Ambassador Raghavan, uh, to Musharraf Zaidi's argument uh, that there will now be increased pressure on Pakistan's Air Force establishment. What is your escalatory plan? Uh, you know, there was Balakot, which was uh, clearly planned. And then there is this accident. And and he he's making the point that while we're all applauding the countries for a mature response, there could be the hardliners within Pakistan who will say, hey, an Indian missile came and you guys just sat back and did nothing. We, we have to account for the fact that those are also real impulses in nations. But that is, uh, that is evident given an adversarial relationship which exists. There is a natural inclination on both countries to believe the worst of the other. Uh, and that cannot be easily uh, corrected. There is nothing which India can immediately do which will uh, correct that impression. That is a natural impression and possibly we in India would have had a similar kind of reaction. The only way to address that uh, is a longer grind of diplomacy and trying to address the overall erosion in the political environment which uh, exists. Yeah. Musharraf, uh, yeah, Ms. Pilya, I know your hands up. Let me just bring in Musharraf first. Musharraf, you heard uh, General Qadian. It is not as if there are not critics of what's happened at home, people pushing for questions, even Rajeshwari, but we're all realistic enough. We've all been around for long enough to know that neither side may get a full transparent account of what exactly went on behind the scenes. There are conflicting reports of whether the hotline was used. Pakistan says no. Indian Air Force officials say there was communication and so on. And this will carry on. Do you believe there is an opportunity here uh, for, for a window to open up, uh, you know, the fact that the militaries, as Ambassador Raghavan said, are almost more able to speak a language that they understand in each other than maybe the political establishments at this point are? I think it's a really interesting evolution, uh, Barka. I, I think everyone on, on the panel, I mean, you and I, of course, know each other well. And I've had, uh, because Ambassador Raghavan was such a splendid uh, representative for his great country in, in my great country, I had uh, multiple opportunities to kind of get to know him better. And I have enormous respect for you both. And I'm sure General Saab and uh, Rajeshwari are both, uh, you know, they're, they're, uh, they met at the same kind of 
uh, respect and and warmth uh, that that I have for the two of you. I say all this because I do want to not so much correct, but I think it's important for Indians to hear uh, the views of you know people that they may not consider hardliners. And I think you and at least Raghavan would both acknowledge that I am by no stretch of the imagination a hardliner. And I'll tell you that my first question after this incident is not. Uh, obviously, the relief is is universal, and so we all feel that. But my first question was about Pakistani capability, and and my concerns are whether my country can defend itself. I I don't think anyone on this panel uh, can can guarantee from the Indian side that India is as uh, stable or uh, uh, responsible a country as it was pre 2014. Uh, and we could we could have that debate, of course. I, and I don't want to make this a nationalistic point. I think focusing on from the Pakistani end, you don't need to be a hardliner to be concerned about the degree of uh, the degree of uh, responsiveness or capability. I see an Indian flag here with with my voiceover, which is very interesting. No, um, there was a Pakistani flag behind the Indian flag as well. You didn't, you missed that. But carry on. Yeah, no, I, I, I like I, to see. And the, and I, I like to see the I, Pakistani flag first. I'm but sure, of course, I'm that's sure. Right. But that, that's just a perspective that we have as citizens of yeah. our own countries. But let if me, I could please, just finish my, yeah, if yeah, I could okay, finish go ahead, my and point, then I'll respond. Yeah, I, go I just, ahead, and then I'll respond. I, I think it, you, we don't need to be hardliners here in Pakistan to be concerned that uh, something like this happened and that. Uh, not only should the defense capability of Pakistan be uh, fully capable of identifying and thwarting that, but that once it has happened, whether it did any damage or not, that Pakistan has the capability and the wherewithal to retaliate in kind. And, and I okay. think that is not a hardline position. It's not a, it's not a warmongering position. It's a position based on the realities of where the countries ha have been and where they are today. And I think Kashmir is central to that question. In acknowledgement of Raghavan's point about the background, he's absolutely right. But it's not just a four or five year thing. I mean, I think it would be legitimate, for example, for Indians to bring up Kargil. Certainly, I would expect Mumbai to be brought, in, uh, brought up in the conversation. And I think in every response, the, the kind of festering wound that is Kashmir is, is really at the end of every conversation. That's where we land up. I understand the Indian perspective on this, and you, you don't need to restate that, but I think it's important for many Indian friends who might be watching or listening, that until we don't deal with that, the, the notion of opportunity, just answering your question now, the notion of an opportunity to make headway, I think, yes, there could be an opportunity, but are Indian leaders willing to revisit August 5th? Mm -hmm. Because if they're yeah. not, then there's no opportunity. I, well, I'm not an Indian leader, but I can tell you the answer is no, uh, just from being a political journalist. Uh, but let me just- And I'm no hardliner and I can say then, then there's no opportunity. Hang on, hang on, hang on. And we'll get into that. I'll go to General Kardian in a second. I just want to respond uh, uh, briefly to what you said about India not being, uh, uh, you know, having the same stability or continuity in policy since uh, domestic politics catapulted the BJP and, and Prime Minister Modi to center stage. I think most of us, irrespective of where we fall on the domestic political spectrum, uh, would disagree with you on that and would say that there is a historic continuity to India being a responsible nuclear nation and there is no change in that. But let me take some of the points you've raised to General Kardian. I just wanted to place that on record and then move on with the conversation. General Kardian, uh, please come in on this. You know, you're obviously very critical about uh, what is uh, what, what has taken place. But when we look in the larger India-Pakistan context, you hear Musharraf Zaidi saying a Pakistani would be within her or his rights to say, is my security system, is my weapon system robust enough? Because tomorrow, what if this is not an accident? That's really the question he's raising. I have already said as an Indian what the Indian state would say, but let's take this further and go ahead, uh, General Gandhi. Uh, Barka, the discussion inevitably had to switch over from the missile firing to the inter-Pak relation. I am happy it has come about. I always believe, I go on a couple of Pakistani channels also, that both countries with tremendous similarity in, in language, in their culture, in their manner of living, should be friendly and move together. We can achieve much more. But you also mentioned that military to military, we have a better understanding, no doubt. It got proved in 1971 in Dhaka. Soon after, within minutes of surrender, we were hugging each other and talking about our ancestors coming from Lucknow or Bareilly. The difference in India and Pakistan is that in India, it is a military. 
in Pakistan, it is the military. I mean, I'm basing my comment on historical precedent that three times they have had martial law, 33 years Pakistan has been ruled by the military. Secondly, if you take the facts, the strength of the Pakistani army, vis-a-vis -vis India, if you take the size of the country, the length of the borders that we face, and we have another adversary on the northeast, their strength is nearly three and a half times of ours. Now, why do Pakistan want to maintain that big an army? There is a, they, they want to create a reason. And my understanding is Kashmir is a reason today. Tomorrow, if Kashmir is resolved, although it appears hypothetical, I think Pakistani army will want something else to come up because they are deeply into uh, commercial activities. Mr. Jaidi will agree they're running as many as 50 commercial ventures with $20 billion of turnover every year, which has nothing to do with the army. Uh, they have started farms and real estate and houseries and whatever it is, 50 such ventures. So my understanding is army to army, soldier to soldier, because a soldier understands the perils of war better than a civilian because they've seen death at a very close angle. But I don't know, Indian Army is, as I said, an instrument of the government. In Pakistan, it is the instrument of the government. I, I, I think it that's is. a very, very compelling point to make that the military, military equations, you know, there have been years, there have been moments in the past that uh, uh, that there has been a suggestion of a military to military dialogue between India and Pakistan, but because of the asymmetric nature of the place of the militaries in the countries, that has never really taken off. Miss Pillay, if you would like to add uh, your point, and then I'll give Ambassador Raghavan the last the last word. Go ahead, uh, Miss Pillay. Uh, yeah, very quickly, I wanted to uh, sort of bring back the focus onto the uh, the incident that accident that happened. And I think to me, the communication is absolutely key. So whether in terms of the DGMO hotline was activated or not, I think that's an important question. How quickly did we inform Pakistan uh, Pakistani authorities about the accident? Uh, some reports said immediately, but again, immediately did it mean? Does it mean we informed them within minutes, within hours? Uh, certainly, I think well before the Pakistani NSA statement came out, we did. Inform them. But again, the MOD statement came two days later. So why did we take that much of time? So I think if, uh, in uh, dealing with uh, some of these things, I think it has to be done from a position of strength. Uh, there are mistakes that happen. There are errors that can happen when handling uh, nuclear or missiles and other systems. But I think that the way you handle it, how you address the whole issue, how you communicate with the adversary, but also within your own self, uh, within your own country, in terms of making a clear statement as to what happen yeah. i think that is going to be the uh, key thing uh, that's going to come out we all learn lessons so that we don't repeat this but i think how you handle this is always going to be uh, the key absolutely. takeaway for me from this in a sense um absolutely ambassador Rakan, where do we go from here you know musharraf almost suggests that without a revisiting of what took place in august uh, you know, in Jammu and Kashmir a couple of years ago, there's no revisiting. I, I think we know that there is going to be no revisiting. Uh, that's quite clear. Uh, so where do we go from here? And then, you know, the stakes are always high between two, two nuclear nations, but two nuclear nations that have no formal dialogue process open anymore. That's that's actually frightening. Well, there's there have been many occasions when there's been no dialogue uh, at all. But I say, as I said, there is a... Uh, there is a cycle which operates in India-Pakistan relations. And my own sense, and this is just my sense, I may be wrong, uh, is that there is uh, certainly a much greater understanding in both countries that perhaps some kind of greater interim stability uh, oh, will be in the interests of both countries for the time being. It doesn't mean that issues will be resolved or solved because there are certain issues which can never be resolved. Kashmir is a foundational difference of opinion between India and Pakistan, and it is going to persist. But certainly, this idea that interim stability or some kind of interim arrangements which impart greater stability, I think that possibly is something which is gaining ground. But there are various tactical elements and tactical factors uh, concerned or related to the domestic politics in both countries, which comes in the way. Uh, we have to see what happens in Pakistan in the next week, uh, 10 days. Uh, that will give some indications about whether we are going to go in the direction of greater interim uh, stability uh, or not.
But certainly, I think at the broad general level in the post-COVID situation, given our own difficulties with China, given what is happening externally in Europe and uh, in Ukraine, etc., I think there is a general realization if we have a more stable relationship, build a little more on the ceasefire, neither side is in a position to go too far. Uh, yeah. But nevertheless, uh, some kind of uh, diplomatic uh, uh, movement forward, which will uh, convey both optically, but also in substantive terms, that there is a more stable uh, arrangement uh, in place, uh, that possibly could be the way forward. I think that's very perceptive that we look for uh, the status quo in this no war, no peace uh, zone that has defined India and Pakistan uh, for some time. And that just to hold the status quo sometimes is an achievement, uh, you know, to not wear off the tightrope uh, that, that, that currently our countries are walking on. We will leave it there. Ambassador Raghavan Musharraf Zaidi, General Qadi and Rajesh Pillay. Thank you. And to our audience, thanks for watching. See you soon. It's great to see you here. Thank you for watching our work. If you haven't subscribed yet, don't forget to click the bell icon and subscribe to Mojo Story and support independent, robust journalism.